to our um, first talk. And this is Karen Kaplan. Hi, everyone. And I'm so honored that she's here. Um, I have known Karen uh, from Adobe, uh, where, where she was working as a vice president and a mentor for all of the technical women in Adobe. And uh, I wish that all the companies could replicate Karen and have her as an executive because she's one of the most supportive uh, women in technology who is trying to advance women to get women in, into the field and to retain them into the field. And she's helping uh, many companies to do so now. In, and she is, uh, as you can see in her credentials, that she is in the board of directors of several of these uh, leadership uh, um, uh, leadership institutions. And she is also a writer. You can uh, read her articles about women in leadership as well as parenting in Woman 2.0 uh, 2 and Fast Company. Uh, and also in her website. I will leave that to Kara. Thank you for speaking. By the way, this is, uh, you met, uh, she's a visiting professor and she had holds the visiting endowed professorship. And Nelson was just started with this the first year and she's our first visitor. Visitor. Yes. <laughs> Thank, you. thank you for those kind words and thank you for inviting me. This is such a wonderful opportunity. I had never been on Mills campus and it's Beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful day as well, but it's just um, it's a beautiful campus. You're also lucky to be here. Um, very quickly, what we're going to do in the next hour is um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the um, TEDx talk that I gave, just like how it came about, what TEDx even is, and then we're going to watch the video, and it's about 17 minutes long. So this is, um, I pulled it down from the YouTube channel for, for TED, um, so we're going to watch what I presented. And then we're having a QA. and a um, So really, as you listen to the, um, to the presentation, please write down your questions or think about them. It's going to be very interactive. I don't have anything else prepared at that point. Um, except if you don't ask questions, I will have some questions to ask you. So that's uh, uh, the deal. OK, so how many people have heard of TED or TEDx in general? Hopefully everyone. Um, OK, for the most part. Um, so it is all about. Um, short videos about ideas that are worth sharing, okay? And the TED conferences have been around for a number of years. They're very popular, very expensive, and people literally, rock stars like Bono speak at those, right? Um, they were so popular that the TED organizers decided to create TEDx. And TEDx is basically a franchise um, where people um, have an idea and they want to put on one of these conferences. It's fine to use that TEDx um, moniker as long as they follow certain um, certain guidelines and those guidelines are things like you have to um, have a theme and you have to show what TED is about like a short video about TED in general and then have your speakers from there um, it also has you, know, you have to have professional videotaping and, and things like that and so all the videos tend to look pretty pretty nice as a result and so I was contacted um, to do this TEDx talk and um, and I want to tell you how it happened because um, it was at the College of William and Mary, which is in Virginia. Never been there before. I'm not an alumni of that um, organization, um, of that school. And I didn't know the organizers, but they knew somebody I knew. Okay, so the power of networking, especially for students, I want to emphasize this. Um, so they contacted my friend, and she couldn't do the TEDx talk. So she said, how about my friend Karen? want to get in touch with her. And they really just, in general, wanted a woman who was an engineer to speak at this TEDx. So, um, so they got in touch with me. So the power of networking is, is really important. Um, they got in touch with me, and I said, sure, without even knowing what it was going to be about. So the theme of this TEDx was um, forward. What are the forces shaping our future? very vague. They just wanted to talk about the future, what's coming, um, and in terms of what are some of the forces that are affecting the future. And when I heard that, I knew I wanted to talk about how women in the tech in industry are kind of the missing force. They're missing from shaping the future because there's so few technical women out there in the industry. Um, and so that's how I crafted my talk. And now I'll show it, unless there are any questions before I show it. So it's about 17 minutes and then we'll do a Q&A. Okay. When was this talk? 
It was this spring in April. <coughs> so often a woman's biggest secret is her age. Back in 1985, I graduated with my degree in computer science. And 1985, well, I'll let you do the math on that. Uh, 1985 was a significant year, not just for me and my friends, but for women across the United States. That year, 37% of all of the undergraduate CS degrees went to women. And what that meant to me is that there were plenty of women in my classes and in the companies I worked at early in my career. But this has changed a lot. In 2011, that ratio dropped by over 50%. And as you can see, the overall number of women getting their degrees in computer science also dropped. So folks, this is a big problem. We need women to be part of the force shaping the future of tech, and they're simply not there. And what's interesting is we actually need more people, more trained computer scientists of any gender to meet the projected job needs of the future. The National Center for Women in Information Technology, using U.S. Department of Labor statistics, have um, they've done a study, and they um, say that U.S. businesses are projecting that we need 1.2 million more computer scientists by the year 2022. And more being, that's what they project to hire in the U.S., as well as accommodating for expected attrition. Now, if we assume that the graduation rates of men and women in computer science stay about the same, only 39% of those needs will be filled by U.S. trained computer scientists. And H-1B visas are not plentiful enough to fill that gap with foreign trained workers. So we clearly need more women, right? <laughs> we need more people too, but we need more women. So, um, women, you know, diversity is a good thing, right? Sure, yeah. Um, we need the balance that women, as well as um, people of different age, ethnicity, and so forth, bring to engineering teams so that the engineering teams will look at problems holistically and solve them for all people. And there are cautionary tales of what happens when you don't have women on your engineering teams. My friend Nora Denzel gave the keynote at the Grace Hopper Conference in 2012. And this conference is the largest conference for technical women. It's totally awesome. And in her keynote, she shared these three cautionary tales. The first is early voice recognition systems. A team of all men created that first system, and they calibrated it to their voices. Well, guess what happened when they tried to sell it to to primarily female secretarial pools, administrative pools. It failed. And then there's the airbag. First airbag technology was developed by all-male engineering team. And they used the height and weight of the standard adult male in their specifications. Well, the unfortunate and very tragic consequence of that was that women and young children were killed when the early airbag was deployed. And then there's access to clean water. As you probably know, over a billion people on our planet do not have access to reliable, clean water. And a few years back, teams went into 15 different African countries to solve, try to solve this problem. And then teams went in afterwards to assess the impact of what they did. And what they found is the teams with women and those teams that involved women in what I call customer research, how is water gathered today, would this solution work, and so forth, those teams with women on them created solutions that were more effective and longer lasting. Now, I don't mean to imply that any of the men on these teams built, you know, set, sort of set out to build solutions only for other men, but you have to wonder what would have been different if women had been on these teams. And there's also interesting information that um, is about how gender drives more innovation. And the National Center for Women and Information Technology released a study they did on patents. And in the software industry, what they found is that 
If a patent filing team had mixed gender, they were 26% more likely to create patents that would be cited than the norm for similar patents. And now, to be highly cited in the patent industry means that you're probably in the center of a citation graph like this. A lot of other patents are referring back to you, citing you, um, for many reasons, one of which can be that you represent a core innovation in your field. Okay? So if you have a woman or more women on your patent team, you're more likely to create, 26% more likely to create a highly cited patent. And that's in the software industry. If you, um, they also did a study on the hardware peripheral market, and that number jumped up to 42%. So women helped, helped drive innovation. And so we, the bottom line is we need more women for this balance that they bring for this innovative, um, excuse me, inclusive design and this ability to drive innovation. And speaking of the bottom line, uh, the research group Catalyst did a study, uh, maybe some of you have seen this in the popular press, um, they did a study about the impact of women on financial performance. And the companies with the most women in their most senior leadership positions were financially more profitable, more successful, than companies with the fewest number of women. And they also looked at the Fortune 500. And those companies in the Fortune 500 that had female CEOs, they outperformed the market. So you may be wondering, where are these women? Why aren't they part of the force shaping the future of tech? Well, I have a theory of why this decline happened since I was in school. And that's the personal computer. So IBM launched the PC in 1981, the year I graduated from high school. And then Apple launched the Macintosh in 1984. And before this, there were very, very few computers in our homes, our schools, our small businesses. And young boys and young girls had pretty much the same experience with computers, right? We, we didn't have any. But that has changed. And computing now is affordable, pervasive. And for whatever societal reason, young boys tend to spend more time playing with computers, playing computer games, as we heard earlier today. Good thing. But they spend more time playing with computers tinkering with the hardware, learning to code, and taking AP computer science in high school. And by the way, AP computer science, only 18% of those exams are taken by women each year. And that exactly mirrors the number of graduates we're seeing a few years down the road. So about a year ago, I had a chance to hear Sheryl Sandberg speak. And she shared a personal story about her seven-year-old son and her seven-year-old niece. And she signed them both up to a summer day camp where they could learn how to program. And her niece was one of five girls out of about 50 campers, so 10%. Now, this, you have to understand, this is seven-year-olds, OK? First of all, seven-year-olds. This is when parents are defining and deciding what summer camp to send their kids to not the other way around. So parents in Silicon Valley are deciding to send primarily only their boys to summer day camp to learn to code. This is called unconscious bias, and it's everywhere. And this unconscious bias that boys are going to like girls, like, <laughs> they're never going to like girls, sorry, <laughs> boys are going to like computers more than young girls will like them leads to girls not spending as much time playing with computers, not learning to code, and if they decide to take a computer science class in college, frankly, they are intimidated. They're intimidated by their classmates, who primarily are young men who have been hacking since they were in elementary school. And what happens to those women? They opt out. Now for some good news. It's not all doom and gloom. You ready for some good news? Yeah. There are groups here in the US and around the world that are focused on educating, encouraging, and empowering girls of all ages to study and learn how to code, study STEM in school, and pursue tech careers. And 
there are organizations that focus on very young girls. There are organizations that focus on professional women. They're all meeting a need. And they're all helping to bring more women into this force where we need them to be helping shaping our future in tech. And there's also good news coming from universities. I'm going to tell you just about three who are doing a great job at building a more inclusive culture. The first is very well known by the women in tech community, and that's Harvey Mudd. This is a small engineering school in Southern California, and they had a big problem a few years ago. They only had 10% of their undergraduates in the CS department were women. And they took specific measures to get it to almost 50%. Here's what they did. To address that intimidation factor I mentioned, they now offer two sections of the intro to computer science class. One if you have experience, one if you don't have any. Okay? So the intimidation factor can be eliminated. They also give a choice. So any programming assignment in those classes, students can choose with, from perhaps a robotics problem or a bio problem or a physics problem, just something that's going to resonate with them. And they're not assuming one size fits all. And they also send every female CS undergrad major to this Grace Hopper conference that I mentioned, where they can be surrounded by role models and inspired to finish their studies. And it's working. Another example, a little less well known, is Carnegie Mellon University um, and the problem they had. In 1995, they had only 7% of their incoming freshmen declared CS majors were women. And they got that up to 42% in just five years. And what did they do? They worked with high schools to make their programs less, um, less uh, focused just on boys, more gender neutral. They added um, or changed their admissions policy to not favor experience, but to look at potential. They added an introductory class called Computers and the Impact on Society, which turns out to uh, be appealing to a lot of the women. And they also set up a little sister, big sister mentoring program for the girls in the, in the department. And Carnegie Mellon points out, not only did, did, did this make it more inclusive for women, but more inclusive for all people. It was all, all good. And last but not least, shout out to William and Mary. Yes. Any computer science students here? All right, I've got a few. So at the undergraduate level in the computer science department, 24% of your students are female. Awesome, better than they have had that nationwide average. But really impressive is that at graduation next month, over half of your graduate degrees are going to go to women in computer science. That's all good. Yeah. That's right. Now this is my daughter, who is a senior in high school. And she's going to study computer science next year in college. I thought I was going to have to bribe her, but I didn't. And last year when we toured schools to find out where she would want to go, I, of course, would ask on every tour, what's your ratio like in the computer science department? And I heard from tour guides as well as professors we met, pretty much the same answer. I don't really know the exact numbers, but it's approaching 50-50. And that's backed up from what I'm hearing in some of the news reports I read. Um, the University of California at Berkeley announced in February of this year that for the first time ever, they have more women than men in their introductory computer science class. The ratio is changing. And I'm thrilled for my daughter, knowing that she has a really good chance of being surrounded by women in her classes and having role models as she starts her career. We may be getting back to 1985, May. Um, of course, until the National Center for Education Statistics reports that we have a, a sort of a sustained change in that ratio, we can't declare success. But I'm still excited for my daughter. And in the meantime, I'm going to celebrate every success I do see. This is the Girls of Steel first robotics team in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this is a high school team. And they are sponsored by Carnegie Mellon's Field Robotics Center. Last month, this team of women, young women, um, won the Engineering Innovation Award at the Buckeye Regional Science and Robotics Fair. Yeah, pretty cool. I think that some of these girls, if not all of them, are going to be part of this force I'm talking about. 
And I'm also going to celebrate every time I see a photo like this come through on my Facebook feed. Um, this is my friend's daughter, Hannah, and three of her classmates from the Loudoun County Academy of Science in Northern Virginia. And last month, Hannah and her classmates took top prizes in their regional science and engineering fair. And Hannah, who is second from the left, took top honors in computer science. And get this, last weekend at the state science and engineering fair, she took first place again. She is definitely part of the force. Yeah. And my ask for all of you is that because of what you're hearing here today, if you have any unconscious biases about girls not liking tech, put those aside and look for ways that you can get females in your life to try to be part of this force moving forward. You know, if you're a parent, if you have young girls in your life, are there the summer day camps to learn to code that you can send them to? Or encourage them to check out that after school robotics program? Or learn to code? If you are an educator, are there things you can do to help address the intimidation factor that young women tend to feel in any STEM field? You know, Carnegie Mellon and um, Harvey Mudd clearly have done some great work, but every university and school is not there. And if you simply want to have great tech solutions to solve the world's problems moving forward, do what you can to try, um, have a woman in your life try tech on for size. It's not going to fit everyone, but it's got to fit more than we're seeing today. And that's it. Uh, you just hit the off button at the top left. There you go. Press it one more time. Yeah, one more time. One more time? Or is it okay? No, it turned off. You're fine. Okay. Um, so, of course, I was speaking um, at this, uh, talking about most of the universities and colleges that are out there as not all girls' schools. So, um, uh, it's definitely a different experience than I hope you have here at Mills, um, but perhaps you experienced some of this in your um, high school ex you know, time or something like that. So I, you know, I do acknowledge this is a special place and, um, and you're probably very lucky as a result. Um, but questions, this is really your time to talk about these issues or ask me things or ask your colleagues, ask your professors. One area more locally where there's a noted deficit in women is in the local startup culture. How would you like to see that addressed? Yeah. yeah. And can everyone hear that or should I repeat the question? Repeat it for the video. Definitely. So it's definitely in the local startup culture here in, in Silicon Valley. Um, there, there's, the problem is magnified, I would say. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's hard to know what to do about that. So why is it magnified? So first of all, um, there tends to be more venture capital money for men. Um, venture capitalists when, they're in, capitalists, when they're investing money, they do what's called pattern matching. Pattern matching is who's the next Mark Zuckerberg? Who's the guy wearing the hoodie that reminds me of that spark I saw in the last investment I made? And I, I don't mean to diss uh, hoodies or anything like that, but that's, that's what they do. It's pattern matching. And, um, and so there is a problem that women tend not to be able to get the venture capital backing that is going to help them grow their startups. Um, and then of course, do um, women do, you know, it takes a brave woman to want to be the first woman at a startup because you have to, um, you're going to be living and breathing so much with these, the guys. And so is that a culture that a woman wants to join? Maybe, maybe not. And so I think it kind of becomes though a self-fulfilling um, prophecy of this is uh, the men are getting ahead and the men are going to attract more men, they're going to attract their friends and, and it just becomes a problem like that. Um, and again, it's, but it's not all doom and gloom. There are uh, venture firms that are focused just on women. There are, um, uh, we are seeing more women VCs. We're seeing some women who have made some money at startups starting to do angel investing, which is very early stage investing. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that might change things. Um, I 
recently met the CTO of a startup in San Francisco called, and I hope I get this right, but um, Blocksbox. I think that's it, Blocksbox. And it is like Netflix for jewelry. So it's a monthly fee, $15 or whatever it is, and you get jewelry sent to you, and you keep that jewelry as long as you want it, and when you're done with it, you send it back and you get your next one, just like a DVD might uh, in the old, with the red envelopes with Netflix. Um, and it's all women. There's only, I think there's only one man in the whole company. So they have the reverse problem where they're trying to attract more men for diversity's sake. And, um, and they're finding that the men don't necessarily want to come and join. And they don't know, you know, they are inviting their friends to interview and that type of thing. So, so it's just interesting that the um, reverse can happen very quickly too. Um, but I don't know if I'm answering your question. I'm sort of speaking about the problem in general. but. Um, Art. Well, I was also wondering, are there any solutions that you feel could help that aren't being implemented at the moment? Mm -hmm. um, I personally would um, love to see uh, more, and some of this is already happening, but more um, support for women, just women, as they identify their business model and brainstorm on that and figure out how to do pitches to venture capitalists, and, um, and frankly, for the venture capitalists to get some um, unconscious bias training. I mentioned unconscious bias in my talk. This is something a lot of the tech companies are doing now. They're bringing in experts to talk and educate the entire workforce about unconscious bias. I'm seeing some yes nods here, of people knowing about this. And it's just to raise awareness of, oh yeah, when I say things like, um, oh, it's we have to make it as sim so simple that my mother could use it. Like, how demeaning is that, that mothers are stupid and can't use tech? You know, it's like, you know, so, so that's just one example of an unconscious bias um, that I've definitely heard my share of. Um, and so doing that training in companies is important. Can we get, get it for the VCs, you know? But I don't know how to go about doing that um, myself. But anyway, I think that might be one solution. Raise awareness. Great, thank you. Yeah. So currently the SF Tech Disrupt has 12% speakers which are women. Mm -hmm. And why do you think there's still kind of this, I feel like it's almost like a resistance and a continual issue. And you would think like something so pronounced as yeah. that. So, so at the SF Tech Disrupt, which is a conference, has only 12% women speakers. Is it coming up soon? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's like next month. month. Yeah, this month, okay, yeah. later this month. So what's going on there, right? I mean, what? There, there are definitely women who could speak at these things um, and so forth. It, but that's not just the only example. I'll share another one. Um, Wall Street Journal does a D conference, digital conference, and it's in Southern California this month or next month. And they announced their speakers a couple of, actually a couple of months ago. So proud, look at our lineup. 12 guys, no women. Okay, so what do I do? I actually reach out to the organizers and say, what the, you know, what the heck? You know, what's going on here? Um, and it actually worked because they got back in touch and they said, oh, it's just the preliminary list of speakers. We, you know, can you help recommend anyone? Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so I, I actually do that. Um, and I did it last year too. Um, another thing that uh, I saw, and I don't mean to be, I'll, I'll share it with you, I don't mean to be um, saying these are evil people, but Greylock is a venture capital firm. And Greylock was having a, um, a hackathon for college students. So this is something they're doing to um, help college students get some visibility into Silicon Valley, earn some money if, um, with the prizes and so forth. So proud. We're having our hackathon. We're proud to announce our judges. Five men, right? So I engage again and say, hey, you know, where are the women? We need to have women be, in, you know, have, it, have women be judges so that they are role models, not just for the women that might be attending the hackathon, but for the men too, to see that women can have some talent here in the space. Um, so personally, I'm just trying to like, I feel like, you know, Dave and Goliath here, but I, I just keep being kind of a squeaky wheel and pointing it out. Um, and I would encourage other people to do that as well if you see that. And, there's often email, you know, general info emails, like, where are the women? I mean, where are the women speakers and things like that? So just keep keep an eye out for it and then tweet about it or use social media and call them out on it. I think that's what we have to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you were next. And I'm I just, just hoping yeah, I just wrote notes that you mentioned, like, you, you basically were like, why isn't there a women incubator in the diversity training? And the initiative of those things. Yes. So you yeah, so, okay, so I answered your question. Oh, well, no, I just wanted to point oh. out for other people, okay. like, you're like, well, this is such a cool idea. Aid initiative does it, you should Google it. 
Yes, so ADA Initiative is um, a great organization. Um, they're based in Australia, but really worldwide focus, and they are all about, um, especially they started in the open source community, which was very, very male-dominated, still is, um, and they are about um, doing a lot of diversity training and this unconscious bias training, as well as codes of conduct at conferences, where it's basically not cool to do you show images of naked women in your presentation, which was happening at open source conferences. Um, it's not cool to have um, anything demeaning towards people, minorities and women, in your hackathons. And as um, some of you might have seen earlier this year, um, the tip stare application that won an award. Um, so, so codes of conduct are great, and they're, the ADA Initiative is an awesome organization for helping su you know, support that, promote it, and get the word out, and do some of the legwork people so that it's easier for them to adopt it. Uh, if I can interrupt, they are actually based in San Francisco. Oh, have they moved? I thought uh, they organized, so I apologize, the organizers originally were from Australia, I thought, so. Okay. No, they, they have Aurora, okay. is American, but uh, Mary Gardner, maybe. Okay. Um, and I'm on the advisory board oh, I didn't the AIDA initiative, if anyone has questions. Excellent. I'm so glad you're working on that. I was just curious when you're talking about the times you've been speaking, Bill, mm -hmm. um, how receptive are people to, are they dismissive, are they accepted, are they just kind of, are they just kind of ignorant, just like, oh, we tried, but there's no one in the program. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what? So the times I have been a squeaky wheel, how accepting are people or dismissive of it? So they're very accepting. They do make excuses like, oh, we look for women and couldn't find any women speakers, women judges, and so forth. Can you help us? And I'm, I'm very happy to spend some time to it. So, so um, they kind of are a little bit, you know, put, put their tail between their legs kind of and, um, and uh, realize they made a mistake. They just weren't even thinking about it. Um, I'll also share with you, um, when I was working at Adobe with Umit, um, I was one of the most senior women in the engineering side of the house as a vice president. And we have had an annual kind of internal conference, a technical conference for all the engineers at the company. And different presentations we given. Umit was on the advisory board um, once I became the squeaky wheel, not before, I don't think. Um, but so there were only men on the advisory board or putting this conference together. And they presented the plan for the conference, the different tracks, the, the themes for it. All of that was great. And then they said, and we're so proud of the diversity. Each of these tracks um, has a chairperson, and look at who it is. It's like someone from every office. Man, 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 man. And I was like, you can't make this stuff up, right? And I, so I said, excuse me, I'm so glad you're focused on diversity. You have someone from every major engineering office around the world, but where are the women? And they're like, oh, forgot. I mean, really, <laughs> that was the reaction, forgot. Uh, how are we going to, how? Can you make some recommendations of women who could be track chairs? And I said, like, yes. And I think at that point, I got you involved. I wrote you in. So thank you for that. Um, as well as a few other women who um, were architects and senior um, principal scientists at the company. They're there. They just like were hanging out with their buddies. And, and that's what happens. You know, hang out with your buddies. You think of people like you when you are putting people in positions like that. Um, anyway, and so, um, so again, receptive, but a little bit like, oh, can you help us here? Didn't even think about it. So to continue on that one, um, I want to ask you, uh, since all of our uh, students are not facing that bias here, yeah. Yeah. and they're going to go out into the wild world, um, what do you recommend them to do? Um, they should definitely be a squeaky wheel and call out for participation, I'm mm -hmm. hearing, right? Mm -hmm. So the video actually, they should call in, for example, if there's a conference and there are no women, they should speak up and mm -hmm. say, hey, I have heard such and such giving wonderful talks. Why isn't she in the program? Or would you consider inviting her to the